Hello, it's great to speak at AppGradCon this year. Ultimately, all of us at this meeting have the same goal, to figure out how inanimate matter organized itself to form cellular life. Today, I'll try to show you how RNA could have played a pivotal role in bridging the worlds of chemistry and biology. We may never accurately retrace the steps back to the origin of life, but looking at life as we know it, uh, the worlds of chemistry and biology must have been bridged by a primitive cellular system generated by the self-assembly of inanimate matter that exhibited the emergent properties of life. Um, such a primitive cell or a protocell would minimally be a sack of genes and enzymes. And this is further simplified by the fact that both genetic and enzymatic functions can be embodied by RNA. Uh, so considering the potentially central role of RNA in the origin and evolution of early life, I'm trying to develop experimental models to demonstrate some of the major chemical transitions um, that RNA had to go through before the emergence of RNA-based uh, cellular life. Of course, it all started with a chaotic collection of chemicals, and then we somehow ended up with this vast uh, diversity of life. So the question here is, what happened in between? Uh, prebiotic chemistry produced the building blocks of RNA, and uh, these building blocks had to be chemically activated so that they could assemble into longer RNA molecules non-enzymatically. Um, we recently discovered that 2-aminoimidazole, or 2-AI as we call it, is a great activating group for non-enzymatic RNA assembly, and it is prebiotically relevant as well, which makes it quite attractive for us. So when activated, these building blocks would self-assemble into longer RNAs, uh, which would then, when sufficiently long, fold up into complex structures in three dimensions and perhaps even show catalytic function. And this RNA assembly process would be turbocharged when some of these longer RNA molecules would start to behave as RNA enzymes or ribozymes that would use the building blocks of non-enzymatic as assembly as substrates for enzymatic RNA assembly. So these ribozymes would be evolutionary links between non-enzymatic and enzymatic RNA assembly processes. Now, it is important to note here that for all of this to happen, these ribozymes needed to be compatible with the prebiotic chemistry that generated activated RNA building blocks. And finally, at some point in this journey, RNA catalysis would have to be compartmentalized where ribozymes would take care of early metabolism and trigger growth and division and perhaps even invent Darwinian evolution in these uh, protocellular systems. So for today's talk, I will use RNA ligation as a model uh, for prebiotic RNA assembly to describe some of these transitions. Um, so let's look at the first major transition, which is the emergence of RNA enzymes that utilize the building blocks of non-enzymatic RNA assembly to make longer RNAs. So we use the technique called in vitro selection to identify RNA enzymes that join two pieces of RNA in this case, with the second piece activated with the two amino imidazole group. Uh, in brief, we started with a combinatorial RNA library that contained uh, a billion billion RNA molecules. And the first RNA piece to be joined was actually covalently linked to each of the sequences in, in the library. And then we challenged this library with a biotin tagged two amino imidazole activated substrate. Uh, sequences that were able to catalyze this ligation reaction between these two pieces would get joined to the biotinylated substrate and therefore be tagged with the biotin themselves. Um, we used magnetic beads coated with streptavidin to capture these uh, sequences because streptavidin binds uh, to biotin very strongly. So these captured RNA sequences on the beads were reverse transcribed to DNA and amplified by PCR. So by repeating this cycle, we were able to identify several distinct classes of ligase ribozymes. Uh, this slide summarizes some of the properties of these RNA enzymes. So the image on the top left sh shows you a denaturing gel, uh, which was used to separate the, the products of this ligation reaction that have 
a slower gel mobility, which once again uh, establishes that these ribozymes are indeed ligase ribozymes, ribozymes that join pieces of RNA together. And then the image on the top uh, center shows you how uh, catalytic activity was enriched across these different rounds of selection uh, from our, our selection protocol. And then we observed uh, about a thousand fold rate accelerations uh, by these selected uh, ribozymes, which is of course great. We also confirmed that uh, this catalytic ligation reaction required a template, which could be either RNA or DNA, and a two amino imidazole activation on the substrate. This was important. Uh, since the two amino imidazole activation on the substrate was an essential feature of this reaction, the next obvious question is, how did these RNA molecules, these RNA oligomers, get activated on early Earth? Now, an interesting chemistry suggested by John Sutherland's group uh, in the UK has used isocyanide, aldehyde, and 2-aminoimidazole to activate uh, nucleoside monophosphates. So we thought that we could use this chemistry to activate oligomeric RNA. And more importantly, we wanted to test if uh, these ligase ribozymes could still function under uh, the conditions of prebiotic RNA activation. Uh, now, before we went into our main experiments, we wanted uh, activation and ribozymatic ligation to happen in one pot, right? So since unactivated substrates in the reaction would bind to the template and therefore inhibit ligation, we wanted to first maximize uh, the activation yields. So we optimized each of the three components in this activation reaction and collectively we, we got about 50% activated substrate, which we thought would be sufficient uh, to drive this reaction. Uh, so this is the experiment. We added unactivated substrate to the ribozyme and template under activation conditions. And then we observed catalytic ligation which means that these unactivated RNAs got activated in situ, in the same pot. And then these could now act as substrates for ribozymatic ligation. So this preliminary result shows that prebiotic chemistry and RNA catalyzed RNA assembly can work together, which is how it would have happened on early Earth. So with RNA enzymes available that can stitch together pieces of RNA activated with this prebiotically relevant um, two amino imidazole group, we are now ready to take the next step, which is to model the emergence of compartmentalized um, RNA catalyzed RNA assembly. So first, how to make a prebiotic compartment. Uh, some of us know that simple short chain fatty acids, which are of course the main component of phospholipids are attractive candidates for primitive cell membranes as they can be made abiotically. And interestingly, fatty acids uh, have also been found in carbonaceous chondrites, which is quite exciting. Uh, but most importantly, these molecules can self-assemble into spherical vesicles that can encapsulate RNA among other molecules. Okay, so ribozymes making long RNAs within fatty acid vesicles appear to be an exciting model for primitive cells, right? Uh, but the seemingly simple model has not been realized yet uh, because of a nagging problem in the field, which is that most ribozymes need medium to high concentrations of magnesium to function, but fatty acid vesicles uh, start to leak at those concentrations. So uh, the bottom line is, you either have stable compartments or you have active ribozymes, uh, but it's kind of hard to get both together. So one of the ways by which we solved this problem is by identifying a ligase ribozyme that worked at sub-millimolar magnesium, right? So under these conditions, fatty acid vesicles would be stable, the ribozymes would also function, which means that this provides an exciting opportunity to constitute the first instance of RNA catalyzed RNA ligation within prebiotic fatty acid compartments. Uh, but before I show you the results for this experiment, I, I would like to play devil's advocate here. So it's obvious that these, these unique ribozymes that work uh, at submillimolar magnesium would be quite rare in the, in the RNA sequence space. So perhaps we must look for a more general systems uh, based approach to solve this magnesium problem. So uh, cutting to the chase, 
uh, I discovered that small molecules like ethylene glycol or D-ribose that would have been present on early Earth and may have even played important roles in, in prebiotic synthesis of RNA building blocks could dramatically stimulate uh, ligase ribozyme function at one millimolar magnesium. Uh, so primitive cells, of course, would contain these molecules within them, right, in addition to RNA. So we could then generate these crowded protocells with encapsulated RNA and uh, D-ribose in this case. Now, what we saw was this, again, helped uh, to constitute RNA-catalyzed RNA ligation within these fatty acid vesicles. And in addition to helping catalysis, we found that ribose stabilized these fatty acid compartments and minimized RNA leakage even in the presence uh, of magnesium. As you can see, even after three hours in the presence of three millimolar magnesium, there's almost no leakage uh, from these uh, fatty acid vesicles if you have D-ribose within them. Okay, so with that, here are these vesicles with fluorescent labeled RNA in them, healthy and handsome in the presence of three millimolar magnesium, even after three hours. Uh, so we put our ligase ribozyme, a template and the activated substrate within these vesicles. And then we added magnesium to the outside to initiate this reaction. And then we broke open these vesicles at various time points uh, to analyze the contents. And to our delight, we observed ligation within these compartments with eels that were comparable to ligation in solution. So this is the first step toward our goal of developing self-replicating protocells where ribozymes would make copies of themselves within prebiotic compartments. Uh, this, of course, has profound implications in the field. So say you have two protocells that have slightly different ribozymes, you know, one with the better ribozyme will make more RNA and then of course grow fat and make more babies faster. And ultimately these are the cells that would take over the entire population, right? So this would represent the spontaneous emergence of a, of a rather primitive version of Darwinian evolution in systems put together from non-living matter. Uh, of course, we are far from achieving this, but meetings such as this make me hopeful. Uh, okay, so that's all I have for today. Uh, I'd like to quickly thank the Shostak Lab, um, Jack, of course, and especially grad student Stephanie Jung, who I collaborated with for some of the work that I discussed here. And thanks a lot for listening. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you.